Hey, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. I am here with Tiffany Williams, and she is a professional organizer, and she specializes in a really interesting topic. It's a frustrating topic because there's a lot of misunderstanding about it, and that's ADHD and clutter. And so today we're going to have that conversation, and we're going to unpack some of the frustrations that we run into, and maybe we're going to come to some solutions today. But one thing I know for sure is that with Tiffany's expertise, we're going to start looking at the world a tiny bit differently than maybe we did earlier today. So please help me welcome Tiffany Williams. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And when you go to a, work with a cu customer or a family that has ADHD issues and clutter issues, mm -hmm. what are some of the common things that you have a tendency to see mm -hmm. that you can help them with? As I mentioned before, uh, doom piles or doom areas are very common. And those are areas that are very tedious because you may have in one doom box 20 different categories and we didn't know where to put it. And so it all just went inside of a bin and we uh -huh. closed the lid and we didn't get back to it. Another thing that I see a lot is on a consultation is a lot of organizing supplies that are unused. And it's because we know that we want to get organized and we read a magazine or we saw a TV show or we saw a TikTok and it's like, oh, you need to have this in order to get organized. But you're not really sure the number of steps that you need to take. Where does it belong? Does this actually work for tailored for me? And so I will find a lot of organizing supplies that just hasn't been used yet inside of a home when I go and walk around. Paperwork, bills, late taxes, overpaying for things, late charges because of auto pay and, and not really keeping on top of the books is another mm -hmm. thing. Everybody with the piles on the desk, right? And another thing that I see a lot is trying to stay organized. We have journals all over the house or little sticky notes or notes everywhere. But when you want to go back to find that information, you don't know, is it in this journal? Where did I leave that sticky note? Where did I leave that little note to myself for the groceries I'm supposed to get? Those sort of things. So I would say those are very common throughout and universal through most homes that I go in as far as really needing some assistance there. And how different is the gap between people that are just disorganized and cluttered and people that have ADHD and are cluttered? I don't know that I can say. I would definitely say most of the time in chronic disorganization, there's a reason why. And mostly being neurodiverse is one of the reasons why you would be considered be chronically disorganized. I don't know that I can separate the two, really. I would just say in comparison to other people that fall under that umbrella, maybe being unable to execute certain steps, being unable to see them, maybe being unable to prioritize, feeling like all of the things that you have to do are equal in urgency when really they may not be, but you can't really decipher the difference. Our taxes and watering watering the plants. Those are not equal, but they may feel equal to a neurodivergent brain. And thank you for explaining that. Do too many people self-diagnose ADHD as a way of procrastination? Oh, I haven't heard that to be true. I do feel like there are certain terms that people kind of throw around out in conversations, hoarding behavior being one of them. ADHD, oh, everybody's a little autistic. So is that a way people are self-diagnosing? That I don't know. Is that a way of saying that you're seeing some challenges? I don't know. But I wouldn't imagine that somebody would give a label that for years and years was considered to be a negative term. I can't imagine someone would use that just to get out of doing something. I haven't seen that personally. Well, I know that as we have these conversations, mm -hmm. that there are symptoms that keep showing up. Mm -hmm. And I think the symptoms are interesting to take a look at because some people, let's say you have a headache, for example, and you say, well, I have a headache. What might be causing that? People go to the internet and they do a search. I have a headache. What might be causing it? There's a whole host of symptoms from mm -hmm. MSG to dehydration. That <laughs> pop up. Right. And so I think it's easy when we get inside the clutter space to hear some terms and go, wait a second, I see elements of that in myself or in my spouse or my child. Mm -hmm. And then we wonder, and, and many of us have not ever been diagnosed with ADHD, but say, oh, I, I think that's me because I have symptoms like that. Right. And so that's why I wanted to have this conversation to find out what are some commonalities 
that are with people do, who do have ADHD because you have experience in this and you are the expert. Yeah. And so by looking at some of those, do some of those situations where you can look at that and say, oh, here is a tactic we can use. Mm. Do they cross over to people mm. that are just wondering, maybe there's a familiar behavior there. I wonder if that mm. tactic would work for me. Right. Yeah. And there are lots of strategies because one person affected with ADHD is one person affected with ADHD. Going Mm. back to what you were saying initially, I would say if you at all are curious or thinking that you might be undiagnosed and are interested in finding out more information, I would speak with your primary care doctor and talk about that process. Some clinicians, if you're seeing a counselor regularly, you could bring up those things that you're seeing, maybe either in yourself or in sometimes in a child, you'll see in your child and then you'll notice it's in yourself as well. So there are licensed uh, therapists that can help you with that and obviously doctors that can start that process because knowing it is sometimes the most important part. You will talk with people that are diagnosed late as someone affected with ADHD. And it's like, oh, that makes sense now. Like I always Mm -hmm. just thought I was weird or there was something wrong with me or whatever. So as far as strategies uh, across the board for clients affected with ADHD, there are some suggestions. And these might be suggestions that a normal person that's not affected with ADHD could use for sure. So inside of organizing, The only touch at once theory is really awesome. And anybody can use that, diagnosed or undiagnosed. In case you don't know what that is, there is a propensity if you're not sure where something belongs that we just drop it here, right? And it never quite gets to where it's supposed to be. And then next thing you know, we have a pile of things that have no home. And so Mm -hmm. the only touch at once theory, especially if you've established a place that it belongs or an area of similar things that belong together, then as if we're touching it, we're not stopping here to pause for a minute and then coming back to it in a week. We're actually going to take it exactly where it goes. And there are some clients that if that's too busy in the moment or the kids need to go to school, then you spend 15 minutes every day and you just pick up all the things that have a place that just haven't been put there yet. So that could be a strategy that anybody um, could use for sure. That's very good. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Another strategy that could be helpful that really is not dependent on a client affected with ADHD, but one of the questions that I do ask is when you look at your home, is the clutter irritating to you? When you look at it, do you even see the clutter or And and some clients will say, the clutter drives me crazy. It stresses me out. It's over, it's overstimulating for me. Mm -hmm. And some clients you'll ask and they say, "I, I don't even see it anymore. And so when you're talking about that, then we can talk about different ways because people that are very sensitive to visual clutter, how you organize would be completely different than somebody that needs visual prompts, Mm -hmm. that needs to have things available that they can see so that they can remember that they exist. Mm. So a perfect example of that is a banker's box on top of the desk, or they're called like a milk crate versus Mm -hmm. a filing cabinet. Some clients, if you put it in a filing cabinet, it's like the black hole. Once it goes in the filing cabinet, I forgot that it ever existed. I'm never going to go back and find it again. And so if it is something that's important that needs to be filed and you are someone that needs that visual reminder that it's there, then we can do a banker's box somewhere that's visual that you literally don't even have to take the lid off. You can just go and grab and then also organize your paperwork back in. That is the difference really between some of the clear open face bins that you will see a lot versus a black garage bin that has a yellow lid. So depending on what kind of person, if you are the kind of person that has to see it, then we get a clear bin in the garage. If you don't want to be overstimulated by the things that are inside the bin, then we're going to get a black one. We're organizing based off of your needs And do you need visual prompts or do you need it organized, but behind a closed cabinet door so that you, it doesn't cause you more, more stress. I love that. And it's a really good point because a lot of people do have different Mm -hmm. ways of dealing with organization and clutter. 
What are some wrong misconceptions that people have about ADHD and how can we overcome them? To be honest, I don't hear a lot of responses from the public about clients affected with ADHD. I would say I, some of the things that I hear from clients affected with ADHD, I've had clients say that they feel like their brain is broken or mm. that a misconception is, this is something that I work a lot with clients affected with ADHD, is like you we're tailoring this to you, your organization, your house, your space, your whatever. It doesn't have to look like anybody else's. And sometimes there's this misconception that because that's what it's supposed to look like. But if that is not functional for you, if that doesn't lessen the number of steps for you in your life, if that doesn't make your life easier, then it doesn't matter what the magazine looks like. We need to get something that's better for you. This is your needs. Let's tailor that so it works for you and not for what you think it's supposed to look like, if that makes sense. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This has been so fascinating. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And thank you guys for showing up today. This was awesome. Thanks, everybody.